I have a confession to make. I have a confession to make, and it's not very popular to make uh, in today's current cultural climate, uh, but the confession is this. I absolutely love bread. <laughs> Are there any other bread lovers in the room? Bread is greater than a salad and everything else. Bread is amazing. Um, and really, uh, there's three types of people, and the first type of person is the type of person that doesn't eat the bread at a restaurant. So I respect that. It's a health decision or it's a, you know, maybe an allergy decision, but who's that? You don't eat the bread at the restaurant. Respect to you, major respect. Number two type of person is the type of person that eats so much of the bread, they get mad at themselves and they can't eat all of their dinner. Now, where are those people at? Come on, okay. <laughs> now, what you might not know, what you might not know is there's actually a third type of person too and that is the type that I am, the type of person that chooses the restaurant according to the type of bread they're going to serve. So, um, so I actually have, and we all know, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about white, disgusting Wonder Bread, okay? Uh, this is a Wonder Bread, but um, I read the ingredient list on it. Um, I don't know what 18 out of the 20 ingredients on this list are. This is not bread. It literally uh, it folds to the shape of my hand as I hold it. It's disgusting. But some of us, and actually, I'm going to leave this out here for free if anyone wants this after service, <clears throat> after it's been crushed by my hand. Some of us, though, you know, then there's kind of the medium bread. So this is okay. Uh, it's 100% it's whole wheat. It's a little bit healthier, but it's still sliced, you know? And I'm not really talking about sliced bread. I'm talking about that good, crispy on the outside, soft on the inside. You could tear it and rip it apart. Sourdough bread. So um, this is for us, babe. Okay, we're going to eat that after service. Okay. These are for free. Hey, in John chapter 6, uh, one of the most famous recorded miracles of Jesus is he gathers a crowd and it gets to be dinner time. And his disciples say to him, how are we going to feed all of these people? There's 5,000 of them. How are we going to feed them? And one disciple kind of meagerly says, you know, the, the only food we can find is this one boy and he has a couple loaves of bread and some fish. And then in John chapter 6, uh, verse 10, Jesus says, make the people sit down. And now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. This morning, we're talking about Thanksgiving. Everyone say Thanksgiving. And how Thanksgiving reminds us of God's faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence this year. God, we just pray you would open up your word to us this morning, and we start off this morning uh, with, with, with that grateful heart, that thankful heart. I'm reminded of the Lord's Prayer, God, where you taught us to pray um, that, that, that you would give us our daily bread. And Lord, I pray for people in this room that are in need of daily provision. I just want to pray specifically, just with eyes closed, if you need God to be a provider, specifically in the area of financial provision, you need that daily bread, just with eyes closed, can you lift your hand up? God, we thank you that you're the provider. You're the provider. You have everything that we need, and we set our hearts to thank you this morning and thankfulness to remind us of your faithfulness to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so in this story, Jesus multiplies um, these loaves, and there's a couple of really, uh, really cool echoes in this story. And just for time's sake, I'm going to uh, go quite quickly through this, but uh, the, there's a couple of very amazing echoes. And number one uh, it is uh, later in the passage, uh, he says this. He says in verse 31, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. How many of you remember the story in Exodus where there's manna in the wilderness? The people of Israel get set free from Egypt, from sin, from slavery. They're wandering through the desert, and God supernaturally rains down bread from heaven. And that, I think, is what Jesus actually echoes in the Lord's Prayer, the daily bread. And it's this bread that the people could go out six days a week and eat for themselves. And then they got double on the last day so they could have seven. And so when Jesus tells this story where he multiplies the 5,000 loaves, he kind of says, hey, this is an echo of that 
wilderness season for the people of God. And in that wilderness season, God was the one who met them with provision. How many of you are thankful that even in our wilderness season, God meets us with provision? God provides for our needs in every season. That's, this is the close of the food series, from feast to famine. God's a provider in every one of those seasons. And so Jesus echoes this, and then he kind of puts a, a, a supernatural, way better than we could have imagined stamp on it, and says this in verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. And Jesus takes this symbol from the wilderness and this symbol from all across scripture and ties it together in himself and says, I am the one that represents God's provision to you. I am the bread of life. Jesus is the one that meets all of our needs. And so we're going to tie together the food series this morning. And I just thought it would be appropriate and fun just to get a little practical this morning. Can we get practical in church? Is that all right? So we're going to, we're going to kind of tie together everything we've talked about food from tables and community to, um, uh, to, to thankfulness and feasting and famine. Everything we've talked about, we're going to tie it together and give three practical ways that we all can put this into practice. And even if you haven't been here for the series, um, I trust it will be okay. You can put these into practice too. Let me give you an example. Uh, number one, the first way we're going to put this series into practice. Everyone say number one. And this is my favorite. I've never gotten to give this charge in church before, so I am enjoying this moment right now. Um, way to put this series into practice is to eat food. All right, so once you go to write that down in your notes, number one, eat food. Eat good food, real food, lots of food. And here's why. Specifically this morning, we're talking about bread and the symbol that it is. I, I wanted to really highlight that section where Jesus gives thanks and breaks the bread because throughout Scripture, bread becomes this symbol of gratitude and thankfulness for God's faithfulness, that in every season, he's the provider. And here's what I love about the symbol of bread is God didn't teach the Israelites that he was faithful by giving them a systematic theology textbook. He taught them that he was faithful by giving them something they could see, touch, smell, and eat bread. When God wanted to show us that he was a savior of the world, he again didn't give us a systematic theology textbook. He gave us a person that we could see, feel, touch, and experience named Jesus. The way God works is he doesn't stay in the world of ideas and theory, but he makes it himself tangible and touchable so that when we eat bread, we get to do it as a sign of thankfulness to God that he's a provider. Does that make sense? It's actually a really spiritual thing to do to eat food with a thankful heart to God. Actually, um, I've been reading a book uh, called, it sounds kind of ironic, but The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. It's kind of a classic book. Has anyone ever read that before, The Celebration of Discipline? I'm not even done with it, but it's so good. I'm going to share a couple quotes from it because it's feeding my soul. But he's talking about different classical spiritual practices that people have practiced throughout history. And he talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. He talks about Bible reading. Lots of things we'd be familiar with, but the one that that I was not expecting to see in there was the spiritual practice of celebration and feasting. And he actually talks about how the ancient Israelites had times during the year where they would celebrate these feasts as a way to give thanks to God for his provision, like during the harvest time. And he talks about feasting. He says it this way. I want to put that Richard um, Foster quote up there, um, that feasting, that's the that right there, is God's appointed way to joy. If we think we will have joy only by praying and singing psalms, we will be disillusioned. But if we live our lives, fill our lives with simple good things and constantly thank God for them, we will be joyful. That is full of joy. How many of you want to be full of joy? 
And, 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 uh, and what about our problems? When we determine to dwell on the good and excellent things in life, we will be so, uh, so full of those things that they will tend to swallow our problems. The decision to set the mind on the higher things of life is an act of the will. That is why celebration is a discipline. And here's what it practically looks like. Because, again, I want to make this sticky, tangible, something that we can do this week. What I love that Richard Foster kind of alludes to here is our job as the people of God is not just to be joyful when we're singing songs on Sunday morning. It's to be joyful on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Because we have access to the joy of heaven, and his name is Jesus. And I just want to suggest that doesn't mean that we just stay in our prayer closet every single day. And if we're not singing worship songs or listening to the fish radio station, we're not joyful. It means we get to enjoy the things that God made for us, like food, because they're signs of his provision and faithfulness to us. Uh, John Ortberg says it better than I could. So I know this is two quotes back to back, but I want to read you this quote from John o Ortberg. And, and, and just, just remember this because we don't have a slide for it. He says this, just to make this so, sen so sensory, so tangible. He says, devote a specific day to acts of celebration so that eventually joy will infuse your entire life. Once it, uh, one day a week Eat foods that you love to eat. Come on, somebody. Listen. Listen to music that moves your soul. Play a sport that stretches and challenges you. Read books that refresh your spirit. Wear clothes that make you happy. Surround yourself with beauty. And as you do these things, give thanks to God for his wonderful goodness. So my question for you is what brings you joy and how are you going to feast with that thing this week? Babe, we're going to eat that sourdough round with some butter. Okay. <laughs> number two, everyone say number two. <laughs> Practice gratitude, thankfulness. Everyone say thankfulness. Paul in Philippians 4, he writes this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let's test how often should we be rejoicing? Great, we're tracking. Let your gentleness be known to everybody. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I already asked you about joy, but how many of you could use some of that peace of God that surpasses all understanding? This has been my prayer, and here's what I love what Paul does is I just want to make us aware. Paul actually writes this letter while he's in prison, in chains, and he's able to say rejoice always. I'll say this. Joy and peace are not dependent on our circumstances, and, and so and kind of Paul kind of says this. Um, he, sa he says, the way to experience that joy, rejoice always, and the way to experience that peace at the end, it, it, the key is that line in the middle, with everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Here's what I want to say this morning. Thanksgiving is the way to see peace and joy in our life. Thanksgiving, giving God thanks, is the way to see peace and joy in our life. And all of us in this room, I hate to say it, but we've been lied to. You've been lied to. I've been lied to. The movies have lied to us. The TV shows have lied to us. Cultures lied to us. And the lie that's been told to us is this, is that our circumstances will make us happy. Or will, sorry, will make us joyful and peaceful. The reality is... Only God can bring us peace and joy because peace and joy aren't rooted in circumstances. They're rooted in the eternal joy and peace of God. Amen. Waiting for our circumstances to bring us peace and joy is kind of like waiting for the gym to come to us so we can grow muscles. <laughs> Has anyone ever had the gym come to your front door before? Well, maybe you can afford to like bring a personal trainer to your house. I don't know. I can't do that. So, um, I don't want to state, I, don't, I, I know this is kind of obvious, but I do work out. Um, <laughs> and I started working out, 
Uh, about five years ago or so, I was not athletic in high school, and so I was like, I'm going to reclaim this. So I started going to the gym uh, a few years ago, and someone had just told me that the way to grow muscles was just to exhaust your muscles. So I never looked it up. I never read anything. I just exhausted my muscles. And like three years in, I was like, nothing's really happening at all. And so like many of you would do if you were working out wrong, um, I read a book about muscle development so I could learn about how to grow muscles. Um, I know not many people would read books. Most people would probably hire a trainer or something or talk to somebody. It's way easier to read a book. Hello, introverts. So um, (laughs) read this book on muscle development and learn that the way to build muscles is not by exhausting your muscles, but it's to lift higher weights and work them out only about 80% because then it leaves room for them to not get exhausted but actually to grow. And so I start to learn that. And and here's, here's my sense is a lot of us have treated peace and joy kind of like the way I used to work out, and it's like I'm just going to live my life and kind of hope that peace and joy come. But here's the reality. Peace and joy are not accidental. They're intentional pursuits. Just like you have to do push-ups to build muscles, you have to practice gratitude to experience peace and joy. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about peace. Everyone say peace. Here's the test for peace, because here's what I don't want to say to you, because this is not what I mean. And I think a lot of times when we preach on peace and especially joy, we think of kind of going through a hard season, gritting our teeth and saying, I'm joyful, I'm joyful, I'm joyful. Here's the reality. Joy and peace are emotions. They're just not emotions based on our circumstances. They're based on the emotions of who God is and what he's doing in our lives. Does that make sense? And so I want to really experience the qualities. I want us to be a people that aren't just peaceful and joyful during worship, but are peaceful and joyful Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So the peace question, the peace question is this, and I think there's a lot of questions you could ask, but for peace, the question is this, do we spend more time thinking about our present moment, or do we spend more time thinking about the future or the past? I think peace is related to presence, and people who are peacefully present are people who are able to think more about the people they're with, the moment they're in, than they do spending time with anxiety about the future or regret about the past. So I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of anxiety in my head about the future, a lot of regret in my head about the past. I'm working with God saying, God, thank you for who you are. Give me that peace that surpasses understanding so I can be fully present with the people that matter most in my life. Um, I think really there's, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to move on to, uh, to joy just for time's sake. Everyone say joy. 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 Here's the, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, joy is the serious business of heaven. And I just want to say this prophetically to us as a church. It's time for us to get serious about joy. It's time for us to get serious about joy. And here's the joy question. Are you ready? The joy question is this. When was the last time you laughed? And I'm not talking about just like a lighthearted laugh. I'm talking about like a deep, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like a deep belly laugh. And then when was the time before that? How regularly are we as the people of God experiencing joy? And shouldn't we of all people be the most joyful because we have the joy of heaven? Richard Foster, again, says it this way. Um, He says this. He says, far and away, the most important benefit of celebration is that it saves us from taking ourselves too seriously. Does anyone have a neighbor that takes themselves too seriously? Just be honest. Just confess for them. Uh, This is a desperately needed grace for all of us who are earnest about spiritual disciplines. It is an occupational hazard of devout folk to become stuffy bores. I will not make you raise your hand if you're sitting next to a stuffy boar, but you know if you are. This should not be. Of all people, we should be the most free, alive, interesting celebration adds a a note of gaiety festivity hilarity to our lives after all jesus rejoiced so fully in life that he was accused of being a wine bibber and a glutton many of us lead such sour lives that we cannot possibly be accused of such things 
Jesus prays for us in John 17 that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be full. Everyone say full. Full. And what I want to kind of correct is I think in the church world, we, again, we've taken that to mean just gritting the truth, gritting our teeth and pretending that we're joyful when it's hard. Paul wrote rejoice always in chains. And I just dare to believe that he was genuinely experiencing the emotion of joy in his life. But where it starts is we have to do the push-ups of thankfulness to see that joy and that peace in our lives. We have to do the push-ups of, uh, of, of, of thankfulness to see that joy and peace in our lives. Just remind yourself of that this week. You can write it on your biceps. <clears throat> and I think that's what it means. How many of you have heard that verse, the joy of the Lord is our strength? Here's what I think that means, because, again, I, I've kind of sang that before in hard times, like, God, I believe someday I'm going to, what I'm actually praying sometimes, and I'm going to be honest with you, what I'm actually praying is, God, change my circumstances so that I can experience joy. I don't think that's what that verse is about. I think that verse is about the joy of the Lord is our strength, meaning we're so good at filling our lives with things that make us joyful, we're strong enough to say no to anxiety and fear. I think that's what the joy of the Lord is our strength is. It means we're so good at thanking God for who he is and what he's doing that we're strong enough in the place of joy and contentment and peace that we're able to say no to those anxious thoughts and depressing thoughts that try and sneak in. So the question isn't, what are you going to do with your circumstances? The question is, how are we going to fill our lives with gratitude And that's, by the way, when we talked about the story of manna in the wilderness, I didn't have time to go into it, but the Israelites are complaining. God gives them bread in the wilderness. How many of you are thankful that God's provision isn't dependent on our performance? He provides for us, and, but then he tests them, and this is the test. Are they going to thank him for what he's given them, or are they going to wish that he gave them something else? And that's our test in the wilderness is are we going to thank God for what he's doing or are we going to wish he was doing something else? And that's the test. And, 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 and really the invitation for us is not to thank God for every season. It's to thank God in every season. We're not thanking God necessarily for our circumstances, but we're thanking him for the manna in the wilderness. What is God doing even in the hard times? And that's what we're going to focus on. I think some of us need to be delivered from thinking about what God's not doing so we can be thankful for what he is. Number three, and I would like to invite uh, Danny to come up and play. Uh, Number three, again, we're getting really practical this morning, is to practice communion. Practice communion. So again, number one is eat food. Please go home this week. Eat food. Thank God for it. Number two, practice thankfulness. Thankfulness is what reminds us of God's faithfulness. And number three is practice communion. Now, this is a practice that the church has been uh, practicing together for 2,000 years. Uh, and really, the word Thanksgiving in Greek is, uh, is Eucharist. Uh, How many of you have heard that word Eucharist before? Sometimes more traditional uh, churches will use the word Eucharist to describe communion. Um, But the word Eucharist in Greek, and I want you to catch this, that's the Greek kind of translation of it, actually means thanksgiving. And what communion originally was, was a time for the family of God to gather around a table and to break bread and Eucharist, give thanks to God for who he is and what he's done in our lives. And that's why today many, again, traditional churches actually have tables that you can come to to receive uh, communion at. Um, We're going to kind of make some spiritual tables in the room this morning to come together and thank God. But I I just want to share, and then you can start playing whenever you're able to, um, just this dream that I had. And then we're going to stand and we're going to take communion together. But um, I had this dream. It was just the weirdest dream. And uh, I was in a bakery. um, uh, And and I'm in this bakery, and, and I'm sitting down in this bakery, and this person comes in points at me and says, bread is the oldest form of culture making, and Christians need to rediscover it. 
I had no idea what that meant. I wrote it down, processed it. Uh, and here, here's what I think it means. I think there's an invitation for us to rediscover bread in our lives, to rediscover feasting and thanking God for the tangible things, to rediscover gratitude as the pathways to joy and peace, to rediscover communion with God. So let's stand up together. Let's stand up. We're going to pass the elements in just a moment, but I want to kind of position our hearts this morning. I don't have an altar call. I don't have an emotional uh, story for us because I really feel charged uh, to call us to action this morning. Um, it's, it's like this. Has anyone ever been to Restoration Hardware and you like the furniture? You like the furniture? Okay. So this church isn't a Restoration Hardware church where you come and look at the furniture and say, wow, that's nice. And then you go back to your, you know, less than Restoration Hardware home. This is the Ikea church. You're going to come, and you're going you're gonna to see the showroom. You're going to see what's possible, but you're not leaving. You're taking the furniture with you, but you got to build it during the week. Do you know what I'm saying? You have to learn <laughs> to put into practice what God's doing. So I don't have an emotional story because I'm charging us this week to have Thanksgiving in July. I'm charging us this week one meal, whether it's with your family, with your friends, whether it's Sunday lunch after church, go around and share a win of your day, the best thing that happened to you today. Everyone say win. win. And I dare you to see peace and joy increase in your life when you're thanking God. So just close your eyes all across the room. Put your hands out like you're going to receive a gift. God, we thank you this morning for your presence. It's so real. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to just identify one practical thing that we're thankful for. And I just want to ask, again, just on the lines of feasting, don't over-spiritualize it. Don't make it, man, I'm just thankful that this really spiritual thing. Get practical with what you're thankful for. What was the coffee you had this morning? What's the provision of the Lord in your life? And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to invite the communion team to start to pass around the elements. And just if you feel a nudge next to you, uh, feel free to grab that juice, grab that cracker, and then just hang on to it. But just kind of in your own internal silent place, just start to thank God for who he is and what he's done. And I'm going to invite Danny to sing out over us as we prepare our hearts this morning. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be Faithful as you are Cause all your promises are yes and amen Faithful as you are Faithful Promises are yes and amen. Cause all your promises are yes and amen. Oh, your faithful God, never let us go. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to highlight just a couple things I feel like God's saying in the room. Um, so again, you can just close. We're just we're having a Thanksgiving service right now. So if you just want to thank God, um, you know what? I was going to have you raise your hands. I think I'm actually going to do it this way. If you want to thank God for financial provision in your life, can you just lift up a shout to Jesus? Jesus, we love you. We love you. Yeah, if you want to thank God for the relationships that he's given you, just say thank you, Jesus. Lift up a shout. What else should we thank God for? Health, if, you're, if, you, if you have some semblance of health, you're alive, you're not dead. Can we just thank God for health this morning? Uh, can we thank God in advance for the most killer Sunday lunch we've ever had, the best food we're going to eat? Thank you, Jesus. All right, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. I think the elements are passed out at this point. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take it in just a moment, but real quick, I'm going to invite us to take just a step out 
from what we're normally comfortable with. Uh, really, I talked about it when communion was initially instituted by Jesus. It was a meal. It was a family coming together to thank God and break bread. So we're going to we're gonna, uh, metaphorically uh, thank God or break bread in a second. But first, I want you to turn to someone next to you, a group of two or three, and share the one thing that you're thankful for. So take 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. Don't even think about it. Just do it. One person or two people next to you. What are you thankful for? Go. All right, 30 more seconds. All right. All right, let's hold the bread. Let's hold the bread. Jesus, we thank you. Say, Jesus, thank you for your body, which was broken, so we don't have to stay broken. Yeah, let's eat this bread together. All right, and raise your, uh, raise your glass of juice. God, thank you for your blood, which was shed for us. Thank you for your blood that was spilt for forgiveness of sins. Thank you that for every person in this room that said yes to Jesus, you've washed away our sin, you've washed away our shame, you've washed away our guilt. So Lord, we love you this morning. We remember you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take this together. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, Ryan didn't know this, but I think Ryan prophesied to the church accidentally. Um, <laughs> That word is just too good to walk away from. We're not a restoration hardware church. We're an Ikea church. That's the picture I really want us to leave with amongst all this said. It's, when you go into Ikea, it costs less, but it doesn't. Because anybody that's tried to put one of those things together knows that it costs a whole lot more. Because when you buy it assembled, it's costly, but your time is the greater cost. And to live these things out costs a lot. And really, that's our challenge as a church, to live out community as we close this series. To live out feasting and famine costs you a lot, but it's a greater gift that the Lord wants to bring about. So grab a hand of a person next to you. Father, we just thank you for the gift of community, the gift of love, the gift of hardship. God, things are hard, they're difficult, but God, you are faithful to be with us always. So Lord, we just say yes to be in the church that hears and does. Lord, that puts to practice the words that you speak. So God, we receive the words you have for this, us this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Have an amazing Sunday. Get your kids ASAP if you can. We're late. If you like prayer, prayer team.